We are live, and let's get our clickety-clack and typewriters and old steampunky material clickety-clack going. And welcome to Troubles in Paradise Evolution Hour, TortukanWordPress.com, the way to dispose of creationism in every possible way and woo in general. Uh, I'm uh, Ruin James Downard. Uh, this is uh, TortukanWordPress.com is my website, and that is our opening logo, and there is our stop sharing, and there is end of that. So, we have another evolution hour, and this is a, um, a jam-packed thing. Karis is here on whether or not uh, uh, Jackson will be here. I put the link out to him, but he's a college kid, and so uh, often is working and doing all the things in classes and other stuff. Hi, uh, uh, Old Scratch, hi, and Lisa for Truth, and Shell Reptile, and that in the live chat. Uh, anyway, um, we'll have a wonderful time. Uh, part two, I'm going to be criticizing our good old um, fun bit. Oh, I need to write a little note down because this, uh, they're, they're rearranging uh, the stupid YouTubes. And um, uh, they put this little message up every once in a while about how they're eliminating the Hangouts. And uh, this one, um, in order for me to write a webcam, okay, there we go. I'll have to check that out because their current beta format is crap. And so it's extremely difficult to figure out what the hell's going on. Anyway, well, hi, Brian, another way the thing. Um, the second half of the show is going to be about Nephilim Free and his attempt to rake me over the coals on the reptile mammal transition. Ooh, I don't think so. Anyway. Um, and those who have been at Side Strikes Movie Night will know what a dire mistake this would have been. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, and Nephilim Free, for those who are uh, lucky enough not to have heard of him, uh, he is a, a hyper presuppositionalist, annoying creationist, um, not necessarily older than me, but he sounds like he's like 90. Uh, and he has a particular manner about it. But anyway, he's a, a, a absolutely convinced that young earth creationism is true, and uh, he can drive you nuts hammering away on his presuppositional points when he tries to do questions. So uh, he's not one to have a neat conversation with. Anyway, um, Contested Bones, the wonderful little book done by Rupian Sanford that a um, friend uh, said, hey, I would love to have this analyzed by source methods and I don't have the time to do it myself. Would you like to do it on the air? And I'd go, sure. So he sent it to me. This is why I, I would not have shelled out a dime for this book otherwise. And uh, so I've been uh, approaching it from a source methods direction, which is find out, okay, they're making claims. What sources are they relying on? What ones are they not? Uh, what subjects come up, what not, how are they handling the, the data field? And right off the bat, I noticed that it has no index and it has no bibliography. Ooh, that slows down the process of, of, of dealing with it. Uh, bad, bad, bad. Question in the uh, chat from Lisa for Truth. Isn't, isn't yeah. Nephilim free flat earth too? The answer to that is yes. So oh, he is? Oh. Should be quite interesting. Oh, I didn't know he was a flurfer too. Not that that surprises me, given how what an annoying jerk he is. If you didn't know but, he was a flurfer, then I may be mistaken. Yeah, so, I, I, I'll have to check my notes on that because some okay. are there are some. Whenever anybody is committed to that point, then I make a little notation uh, on them. But okay, he's he's an idiot. Then, uh, he's an he, idiot just on the young Earth creationism aspect. Uh, that um, as I will be. I thought he to was. I may be very mistaken. So. Yeah, they're um, um, young earth creationists, uh, flat earthers tend to be young earth creationists and geocentrists just as a demographic group. And this has been the case for a long time. They're, they're very biblical fundamentalists. This was true back in the 19th century when Alfred Wallace was bumping into them and was just as true in the 20th century and is just as true now. Uh, there, You may find a kind of vague new agey hip hop artist kind of flat earther who gets their stuff from the videos and uh, and so is able to connect up to that frame without having come through that biblical apologetics angle, but it, they're relatively rare. Alan and, Smith is saying that he does not believe that Nephilim Free is flat earth. I shall stand happily corrected. I got him confused with the rest of the stupid on movie night. Yeah, oh yeah, there's, there's an awful lot of uh, people with similar names 
the Nephilim do show up as a trope uh, in the flat earth community and in a lot of the fringe, 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 fringe creationists where they think that the Smithsonian are hiding giant skeletons of the Nephilim uh, buried away in their archives like Area 51 or uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark warehouse. I mean, it's that kind of imagery that they, they come to mind with. But uh, So it's very easy to confuse things and, and that's why I try to gradually build up a network of where uh, like on all, all the people on Twitter, you actually have a core clue name in addition to what the tag name is. They're not necessarily the same. And you can often find the same people have changed their plumage, but they still got the same core address at the app part. <laughs> and uh, to show that people uh, that the ones would... Um, uh, Helena Henzo was notorious because he was a racist nincompoop of constantly reinventing his name, but they often had the same structure to the new name. Uh, and that, that pops up an awful lot. So um, always, always be careful on things and always go by asking people questions. Uh, sorry there, uh, Shell Reptile. I'm going to mention source methods again. Uh, find out what people think. Don't presume what they think, even if they um, uh, cite particular uh, material they might they may not realize the context of it so there may be people who uh, a young earth creationist who um, siphon off michael behe even though behe is not a young earth creationist uh, or vice versa intelligent design people that may bump into somebody like nathaniel jensen not realizing that they're a young earth creationist or john sanford uh, from this book who's a young earth creationist they, they don't always mention it and so you have to be very very careful but if if they're making stupid claims that you can objectively verify independent of what baggage they're carrying. Well, they've you've screwed them there, right? Off the get-go. And the fact that they may or may not have additional stupid baggage that you can find out by questioning, now get them on the things you can get them on. Anyway, um, the topic that came up uh, is Homo ergaster. And for those of you who have not heard of them, which I would imagine is most everybody, uh, it's not a common name. There are a bunch of little minor um, taxa uh, in our own genus, uh, Homo rudolfensis and that uh, are, uh, is another one, that are uh, somewhat controversial or problematic in that we don't absolutely know the range of Homo erectus. So is this possibly a regional variation that's till, still technically in the same species, or is it in fact an actually new species? And when you have only fragmentary remains, you don't have a, a population of them, you don't have a, a, a juvenile to an adult, you don't have a good context to be able to have a lot of examples. Um, it's an iffy situation, but it still means you can tell what it isn't. Homo ergaster definitely ain't a Neanderthal. It definitely ain't Homo sapiens. It's not an Australopithecine. It's past that. It's in our genus. So it's either a Homo erectus or maybe its own species of Homo ergaster. That's where things go. Well, in the pigeonhole land of creationism, there's apes and then there's humans. And there ain't no middle ground. There's no transitionals. There's no almosts. So they can easily lump all the Australopithecines over into that category. But their uh, a, a rupee is tiptoeing out onto a particularly dangerous, uh, but not implausible gangplank in that everything all had to happen at once. I mean, you, Karis, you came from a, a creationist background, so you would uh, be familiar with the idea that all the animals all had to have been coexisting. Yeah. Yeah. So Australopithecines must have coexisted with our species and because they're a separate kind from us, theoretically, they would have been on the Ark, although the Ark encounter did not show any Australopithecines. Uh, and and were, they, were they needed to be kept in a cage? Did well, you, I mean, would, unless would, they were said to have gone extinct before the Ark incident. Yeah, in well, case, I don't... On the ark. Yeah, I, uh, that's actually a good prospect, although I don't know of any creationist that's thought it through that closely. So you're already ahead. <laughs> <laughs> of uh, of the, the main body of creationists who just don't really think, Perhaps ironically. I've, I've, uh, kind of redeemed myself from earlier. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, that actually reminds a really useful point that the model before the evolutionary one was in a generic biblical sense, the idea of a perfectly created creation. And therefore, extinction was not on the plate. 
The idea that anything should have gone extinct when the whole purpose was that it was a perfect creation and that all the animals were put on the ark for preservation by Noah and they all successfully made it because Noah did and here we are and therefore they must be there. So the idea that animals could have gone extinct or that there could have been a long, 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 long time between the Noahic world and the first animals was a big shock that started hitting in the late 18th century and into the 19th century as people went out in the world and started digging up crap uh, and they started fitting in more and more stuff. And so by the time of Baron Cuvier, there's another little name if you do not know, it's the French Baron Cuvier. I do not remember the 15 or so names he has in addition to that, and which is why they tend to call him Baron Cuvier because it takes up much less space. RJ, uh, you're missing your cute little hat while you talk like this. Oh, yes, I should have a little beret <laughs> and a baguette. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, he... He was one of the first big super duper comparative anatomists. He lived in the late 18th and into the early 19th century. He was not an evolutionist uh, and he died before he really had to think about that. Whereas someone like um, a Richard Owen, who was a slightly younger English contemporary, another great anatomist uh, of, the, of the period did live into the Darwin era and he had to make up his mind and he couldn't buy into evolution. He came up with these wacky archetypes and stuff, which is kind of the, um, uh, he was sort of fence straddling types and uh, um, uh, evolutionary notion that there could have been things that are related to each other, but don't press him on it. Uh, anyway, that's a, a bit of a digression on, on the history of, uh, of the period. I, I went into a lot of the history, although there's, there's way more that even now that I know of, but anyway, a, a quite a lot of the history in a lot of the tip chapters, uh, the old tips. So download those damn things if you haven't. Um, just the tip. Yeah, just the tip of the tip. <laughs> Troubles in paradise. But the, um, they're written in the older scholarly sc style I grew up in in the 1960s and 70s in the scholarly world. My BA in history and all of that, the, the, the digressionary footnotes and, and all of that was just the standard procedure on that. And that's what I wrote uh, um, in the late 1990s uh, in the, the TIP project. Uh, now we're in a different world. We're in the hyperlink world and all of that. And so I've been trying to shift everything over to eliminate footnotes, uh, although um, uh, Dear Jackson is fond of them. And so there are examples of where what would be a kind of digressionary comment we can pull down into the notes section. So it's been an interesting little tug of war going on that. Anyway, um, Homo ergaster. Um, the wonderful thing about source methods is you get to see the original material. And that's why it's so important because again and again and again, even things that seem non-controversial can sometimes be really not what they're saying when you start looking up the original material. And you'll be seeing in particular uh, examples in the new Rocks for Their book where there are just case after case after case of things that you go, you almost let it slide when the creationist says it. And then you start thinking, well, wait a minute, is that actually true? And then you start doing research and you discover, no, they're wrong even on that. <laughs> anyway, here you will notice the cute little picture right up here of um, there's an Australopithecine on the one side and then the other one with the glowy eyeballs uh, is Homo ergaster or what they refer to as only Homo erectus slash H. sapiens that they go to a great deal to argue that that is actually an H. sapiens. And even they put up in here, note the interior of 3733 is illuminated, not shadow. They're trying to imply that this was done merely to um, highlight the apish quality, I guess, of the Australopithecine. They didn't really go into great detail on it. But anyway, that picture was just hovering in the background until I went down and was tracking down the sources. And at the bottom of the page, it said leaky are Australopithecus homo erectus and the single species hypothesis. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the single he species hypothesis is, raise your hand, probably all of you. Uh, that was the idea. And I went into it in a lot in the Planet of the Apes chapter at TIP. Plug again for TIP. Um, in the short form, it was the idea that there would be species A, which turns into species B, and that means species A is extinct, and then species B turns into species C, species B is now extinct. That kind of ladder of progress. And that was the old style 
of conservative conventional evolutionary thinking in the late 19th and well into the 20th century. Meanwhile, new generation of what eventually would be thought of as population biologists and uh, punctuated equilibrium paleontologists like Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge uh, were saying, yeah, wait a minute, sympatric speciation would involve species A broadening its range and then fissioning off. So A now has a B and then if they become isolated reproductively, now you got two species and A has not disappeared. So you could have a shrubbery of species moving through millions of years of which there would be overlaps between one species and its uh, descended species. Uh, and which one, some of them peter out and others, it's very much more intricate. Uh, that made sense in terms of what people saw with living species. And as more and more and more of these uh, uh, hominids started showing up, that's what we were seeing there. So the, the, you might argue that the last ditch effort um, of defending the single species concept um, was um, uh, with representing leaky and the leaky tradition. And for one thing too, they didn't much like those damned Australopithecines. Uh, there was a different camp that was saying, no, this is the group that was there. Leakey was thinking that, that the ancestor, all the way back to Louis Leakey, I was mentioning to Karis before we went on the air, there's a whole bunch of Leakeys. There's there's a Louis Leakey and Richard Leakey and uh, Maeve Leakey and Mary Leakey. It's been a family tradition going on and they have changed quite a bit in their thinking since 1976. But in the 1970s, they were still hanging on to the dad's model of Homo sapiens coming from a much earlier and not as small brained a critter as the Australopithecines were. And so they were still holding out hope that there was going to be this holy grail and going back way four million years or more. And the idea that, that the human species could have been emerging much more recently out of these Australopithecines, only a few million years old, didn't fit their single species model. Anyway, so I looked up the paper, which I had actually, I found by my surprise, I had downloaded the damn thing, but it for, I hadn't put it in my reference bibliography. I don't know how it got lost, uh, but I only stumbled on it when I looked it up again for this reference and found I already had saved the, the, the PDF uh, in there. And I go, wait a minute. Oh, so I put all that into it. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go into another clumsy uh, RJ looks for the button to do screen share because I have the paper and I have a, a link to it. So you don't have to take my word for it. You go ahead and, and, and can download it and uh, look at it yourself. Let's go our little screen share and our application window. And there we go. Okay. So theoretically, you should all be seeing down here is the one that was used by Rupi and Sanford. It's the same picture. This is where they got it from in that thing they cited. And by the way, they left off uh, the other co-author in here uh, that um, it's uh, Walker and uh, they forgot to put the name in. But anyway, look at the one up here. Same skulls, but from the side view. And you can see the Australopithecine one is even more ape-like. There's a flatter face on Homo ergaster, but look at those brow ridges. This is not a human skull. You might mistake it for one if all you show is this picture, but it ain't gonna fly if you're looking at this picture. And the fact that Rupi and Sanford, or probably Rupi, who was doing all of the technical material, had to have seen that picture because they had this picture, means they're suppressing the data field. And that is not a good thing. Would you agree, Karis? Indeed. Yeah, this is a, a matter of the stuff you find out that had they not, had they picked that picture up from some other source, um, that would have been one thing, but they nicked it from a paper and cited the paper, mangled the reference, but they still cited it, which means, no, they, they knew about this. And their failure to put it in their argument is because it didn't fit their argument. And they would have had to have explained. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's, um, this goes beyond lack of education. This is an attempt at a deliberate attempt at deception. And Bingo. that's where I have to start um, questioning their motives here. Because if they're actually going for truth, then um, that would not be happening. If, if yeah. your faith require, requires you to choose between it and presenting truth, then you need to really question your relationship with truth. 
if now, your faith is what you choose over truth. The goal of any scientific model is to account for the data. And if the creationist wants to present a creationist model, well, fine and dandy, do it. But you got to pay attention to all the data. And when you see them flushing data down the stream, when you see them ignoring information, uh-oh, they haven't got on the field then. They, they And plus, they never actually present a model. It's always not Darwinism, not the creationist, which I guess is just cuz magic uh, um, they created and then they don't think about it. Um, uh, we had some little fun side conversation where old scratch notes that standing for truth has already had another debate still claiming the dinosaurs live with humans. Oh yeah, he'll do that. Yeah, that's his part of the dogma. He's never going to give up on it. Like created heterozygosity. He, it's ingrained in his bread. Um, I have to point out something that when there, there are some times when we say somebody is ignoring this fact or ignoring that fact, but if they're, um, if they're really just taking things deliberately out of context and that sort of thing, they're not ignoring these facts at all. They're omitting them. It's yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, it's depression. not a yeah. lie by omission. This is a deliberate thing that they're doing. Yeah, and when they have, um, in real scientific research or real historical research, any rigorous discipline, you are aware of all the problems with your argument and you address them. And you may have hypotheses that could account for them, and people can decide whether those are good or bad hypotheses. But nary is heard a discouraging word in creationism. They don't typically discuss the problems with their argument. Once in a while, you'll get fistfights. Uh, and these happen in very obscure little papers lurking around in the crannies of Answers in Genesis or in the in the creation research. Do you society. have any um, humorous an anecdotes about uh, something like this that would be oh oh we're we're, we're um, uh, alluding to it um, in the uh, rocks were there book uh, over um, uh, Australopithecus sediba which by the way when this subject came up I was looking to see whether or not Todd Wood's paper on sediba was going to be mentioned in contested bones nope didn't even discuss it because using the creationist models uh, nopa and these various little uh, analytical tools that they use to try to determine kinds. Um, Australopithecus sediba popped up in the human hollow barrowman as one of our bunch. And this was like, this is amazing, even from an evolutionary point of view. What, what an Australopithecine is showing up as part of the human uh, 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 genus? That's nonsense. That ain't going to wash. Something's wrong with your, with your tools. But anyway, the creationists just had a conniption fit. And, and there were three or four, uh, I think, Menton and, uh, oh, uh, I uh, think, uh, um, uh, oh, Bodie Hodge's colleague, uh, Georgia Purdom, and I think another one lit into him uh, on this very point, be not because they could dispute any forensics, but just because they didn't like the idea that an Australopithecine was showing up in the human genus. And so it was a, a, a weird uh, set of circumstances on it. You get... Um, a little bit of that, which I have yet to find all of the pieces regarding when Andrew Snelling um, claimed that there was more than one flood. Uh, this was way back in the 1990s, and I still haven't been able to um, pull all the materials. I've had too many things on the plate to try to get all of that on. But, more but, than one flood. Yeah, yeah, because of uh, intermittent volcanic ash, for one thing, that there are way too many fossil deposits where they've got interbedded ash before and after. Well, that can't happen in a big slosh. <laughs> that's airborne ash. That, that's, it doesn't work. And so um, any of those have to be post-flood. So he thought there must have been, and if uh, the idea that this stuff has to be in a flood, so you would have to have a flood and then things dry out and there's airborne ash and then there's another flood and then some more airborne ash. And so you've got, you know, like the sprinklers turning on and off. Um, this was not a very compelling argument uh, because it's claptrap. But one of those who jumps at the word at the phrase "replenish the earth" in Genesis. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's another matter altogether, uh, which has to do with what happened post flood with the critters on the ark, and then of course the the the, the big question marks: what's going on with the oceans? all those fish and plesiosaurs and whales and all this stuff all living together 
and yet we are not finding them in the fossil record together. We find them in very disparate things that suggest completely different ecosystems. You know, diatoms don't even show all up. Uh, we find we find diatoms and foraminifera that rain their little bodies, their little shell thingies that look like little weird crystalline balls uh, down on the seafloor in fabulous quantities. So you can have like 20 million year record of those things. Obviously not 20 million years in the creationist framework. But the point is, is what would have stopped those critters? We know they would have existed. And if all of them existed at the same time, how do how come we don't find foraminifera in the Cambrian? Ocean deposits there. How What could have prevented them from doing that? It just, it, you know, yeah. So all that ocean stuff uh, can't be accounted for. And then insects. Oh, those prolific little bugs, millions of species of them, most of which don't live underwater. So what was going on with them? They, they don't want them on the ark. Uh, they don't want, they don't want the termites there to go through the gopher wood. Uh, but they've got, they've just way too many insects. Um, you know, you've got uh, um, 600,000 species of beetles. I mean, that's it, it, just horrific to try to figure out what kinds there are. And uh, so they just don't think about it. Uh, Lisa for Truth asks, how do they explain whales being mammals? They don't really have a problem with that. Um, the, the fun part is, why are they mammals? And that they don't really deal with. It's just because. But the uh, uh, here's another one of those funky little things, because you remember, Karis, from Psy Strikes tour through the uh, Ark, one of the things they've got in there is a pack of seeded, the land ancestors of the whales. And they... <laughs> And they're functionally suggesting, and, and Kurt Wise and the others are, are hinting at, they don't really get into too much detail, and you can understand why, that the whales might have developed just since the flood. Then why do we find fossils of them? I, I think why was there a, evolution, it wasn't a thing. Th th there's a, there's a, a weird disconnect going on here as to what was going on. And if the Pacacetids were on the ark, where are they now? Why don't we find them anywhere? Uh, they're perfectly fine little little critters. For the interest with. of those listening, um, where might they find allusions to this from people like Kurt Wise and others? Oh gosh, uh, I'm trying to think of where. Uh, they're mainly in papers in the Answers Research Journal. And all of that's open access, by the way. You'll be able to download the PDFs on it uh, and, and, and read them in week. I'm surprised um, Answers. They're trying. Oh, no, no, they're, 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 uh, you got to give them A for effort, Karis. There is a band, all of those pheromonologists, <laughs> uh, well, F, F for output, but A for effort, <laughs> because they're trying to be sciencey. I mean, they really think they're being sciencey. And, and it so makes no they, sense. They, I mean, magic suffices for everything else, but with the art, no, it has to be scientifically plausible. Yeah, they, they, they're, well, th this is a long-term uh, affectation of pseudoscientists, not just creationists, that they want their stuff to have a patina of scientific veracity to it. Because well, they don't require such things for the creation account or Jesus turning water into wine or Jesus walking on water. All of those must be miracles and you must accept them as such. But when it comes mm -hmm. to the art, now suddenly we bring these engineers well, another making a moon story. pool of the ark. Come on. Yeah, another story, the same thing is the Exodus. Uh, that the, there's a long tradition of trying to figure out natural phenomenon that produces the exodus. Why can't they just leave it a miracle? <laughs> I mean, why, why even include miracles? I mean, we, we get, um, we as atheists get lambasted for our lack of faith in miracles, but then they want to turn everything into something that is scientifically plausible. So which is it? <laughs> yeah, there, there's a... Um, all of this becomes painfully clear when you just asked of the creationists, how many kinds are there? Which kinds are there? If they bring up an animal, you say, well, is that a separate kind from so-and-so? And that's why um, if you have a, a zoological or paleontological interest, become well-versed in a particular area and use that as ammunition to where you ask the creationist, well, is such-and-so, uh, if you're talking like bird evolution, you could say, okay, 
are uh, are archaeopterygids uh, in the bird kind? Is there a bird kind? If there are a more than one, how many of them are there? How did you determine that? Where do enantornithines fit in the uh, opposite birds of the Cretaceous? I mean, and and pretty soon you're going to get a Kent Hovind eyes glaze overlook uh, from most of them because they've never thought to think about that. They don't really, they may use the word barrowman or kind um, as like a talisman, like a crucifix waving away a vampire. But um, if you're, uh, <laughs> I'm suddenly reminded of, I don't know if you've ever seen Roman Polanski's old comedy. Uh, he's very controversial now because uh, of, of quite different matters. But he did a comedy, The Fearless Vampire Killers. And this person, um, the vampire comes up and he happens to have been a Jew. And so the guy is picking up a crucifix to slow him down and the, and, and the vampire says, boy, did you pick the wrong vampire? <laughs> <laughs> But the, the creationists are in that same mode. They, they think they have a model of how speciation and stuff works and how kindology works, but they don't. And you can tell that because they don't really apply kindology. it. And it <laughs> kindology. Kindology, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, baromenology sounds a little better, but functionally that's what it is. It's the notion that there are created kinds that are discontinuous, that no kind ever spawns a new kind. Otherwise, it would be the same kind. And uh, all kinds have no antecedents. They were specially created zot. Well, when and then what happened to them after that? And so they've got that double bottleneck that I mentioned in other videos, which is the original kinds have to generate all the ones you see in the fossil record. Then the kinds are then put on the ark in two or seven, depending upon whether they're clean or not. And then after that, those kinds generate all the diversity that we can see today, but not generating what we saw earlier in the pre-flood world? Well, maybe that's because the pre-flood world was different in ways they don't really think about. So some of them think there was a pressure cooker and immense uh, uh, thick clouds and Gila monsters were growing as big as uh, dinosaurs and all of that. That they, they, There's a bunch of cartoon tropes they come up with for it, but they never can get very close on the detail front. So, uh, oh, we're after, oh, I'm, I'm jibber jabbering on here. Let me do my shameless plug and uh, and thank you a uh, uh, moment for all of our patrons. Uh, there we go. We got our little screen share again. Come on, click the damn button. There we go. Application window, there we go and share. So. Uh, there's our patrons. Thank you very much, everybody who has helped. Our colleagues, Hendril and Puffalophagus and Eric and Surus, and our researchers, Travis and Convert Me and Eaton, Brad and Ralph and Palogia and Ugly German Truths. I think they're pretty German truths. And Sewer and assistant researchers, Mike and Duranko and James and Nyanya and Benjamin and Totus Real and our friends, Daniel and Stephen and Mary Gale and insects are cool. They are Morton and Bo and Staggles and Alex and Paul and legacy patrons who were able to help earlier, but they haven't been able to continue on a recurring basis, but I still thank you. Anyway, uh, Jen and Jody and John and Keith and Andrew and Dyer and Yui and Mona and Daniel and Son and Everett and Zeshi. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I, I will then do the Behold and Partake, tortukanwordpress.com. Everything there is open access and you can share it freely, all those damn PDFs that I worked years on. And then you can become a patron even here. Uh, right there at um, Downer uh, Tip. And then also another way you can donate or do it on a recurring basis at GoFundMe.com, DC Go, either one of those places. Or if you have a bunch of money burning hole in your pocket, you could do it in both. Uh, that's the way it is. But uh, that's how I supplement my income in addition to Social Security and book royalties, which trickle in depending upon how many books that are sold. So if you haven't got your copy, of uh, Evolution Slam Dunk or Fiction, uh, Paralox of Phileas Fogg, well, get it and uh, and add that to your list and think about it, giving them out as um, uh, birthday and Christmas presents and all that kind of stuff. So that's um, the uh, exciting world of my shameless plugism uh, that I'm a uh, effectively retiree with a killer no hobby. So I oh, haven't we were, really stopped just, working. We were talking in the chat. Yeah. Somebody had said, um, asked if this was your profession or your hobby and remarked that if this is your hobby, you put yours puts everybody else's a shame or at least your dedication to it and expertise in it. Yeah, it just grew by uh, like Topsy. Uh, I started in this in the 1980s. What's Topsy? Um, oh, Topsy Turvy. <laughs> 
Yeah, old, old. Um, and and uh, a Topsy is, I think, also some character in nineteenth century fiction. You see, I'm an old fart, Karis. You see, I mean, I'm all of the things that are so old they have cobwebs on them. You know, I'm like a, I'm a refugee from a Dickens novel. <laughs> also, also, we've also we've got Sai in the side chat. Oh, oh, Sai. Uh, anyway, the there um, is a question from the side oh, chat. Oh, um, mutable destiny. No, Alan Smith, though, um, immutable, immutable Destiny, I'm sure, needs to be spoken of as well. I'll answer Alan that, too, Smith but Earthworks at, on the Ark? At, yes. Yeah, round and work, as, round a, work, tape work. as a former fundamentalist, my answer to that would be it was God who brought each of the animals or pairs or groups onto the Ark himself. Therefore, as roundworms and tapeworms do, in fact, exist today, it is presumed that he did find a way to bring those onto the Ark. That and then don't ask us any more about there. that. <laughs> right. And that's what you get where all of those um, little wiggly little critters that are, in fact, absolutely essential. Earthworms, for that matter. You know, there's a whole bunch of things, plus all those damned insects. Nematodes. Oh, mm -hmm. my. Nematodes. There are like a million species of nematodes, many of them living parasitically in places that you really don't want to think about. That's great. Uh, that's great. I'm now thinking about them. <laughs> yeah. And so what was going on with that? They would have to account for that. And they don't want to think about that. They, they really have a problem with parasites. Um, there was an example that uh, uh, dropped my jaw when I saw it. It's going into the new uh, Rocks book that cholera was beneficial originally. That it was designed supposedly. This is an argument I'm not making up. This was actually put forward by a creationist. That cholera was there to chomp on the chitin of seashells. And so to keep the world from being inundated with seashell carcasses on the beach, never mind that why did the animals have shells to begin with, to protect them from the non-predation, from the non-predators prior to the, to the fall? I mean, they, they just don't, they haven't thought this damn thing through. But the problem was they haven't thought cholera through either and how it, its dynamics, uh, no, it's not, the organism, it's not the only organism that can dissolve chitin. Our tummies can actually dissolve, dissolve chitin. We have uh, um, biological systems that can disintegrate chitin. Uh, well, there are some own. other essentials that have not been thought through, and Immutable Destiny touches on this. He, he yeah. or she asks, also, RJ, if it was raining nonstop for 40 days straight, wouldn't that kill all the cyanobacteria, starving everything of oxygen and making everything going extinct instantly? And uh, I can't speak of the bacteria, but there are other things they haven't spoken of. If you take seeds and the seeds and submerge them for say oh a year <laughs> go ahead and <laughs> see just how uh just how much will grow yeah and that's how that. long the waters were on the earth although it rained for 40 days and 49 mm -hmm. the water didn't go away and right. when you actually add up all the numbers in the bible by their own account the water was around the planet for a year and uh that's awkward uh, cyanobacteria are fucky little things because uh, they are uh, not merely uh, photosynthetic. They were the first bacterial form that did photosynthesis, and they, they started polluting the environment with this corrosive oxygen crap. And all of the anaerobic bacteria were going, <laughs> because they, uh, they don't like oxygen. And so what used to be the big thing, you know, the anaerobes were just ruling the worst work, uh, roost until these damn cyanobacteria came along, and they their oxygen pollution rusted the oceans. That's where most of our iron deposits come from. Uh, and uh, they also ended up as endosymbionts as the plastids, the chloroplasts in uh, plants. So everything that needs sunlight coming in mm -hmm. is going to be a problem if right. they can't get to it. And Not only so that, but think of the germination time for seeds to replant themselves and the number of herbivores that would need to rely on plants in order to survive and the carnivores which were yeah. on the earth, et cetera, et cetera. But germination time for seedlings complex, just for them to sprout, let alone all grow. Of the, uh, did you see uh, uh, Jackson's latest video on plants? I haven't been watching videos lately. It's a nifty one. It's quite a long one. It's about 26 minutes because he, hmm. he bit the bullet. Frank Turek had made a comment about uh, the inexplicable plants that the evolutionists can't account for. And Jackson said, oh, want to bet? <laughs> so <laughs> he uh, he did a really Jim crack job and Nestle uh, put in a lot of commentary too. And it, it, it I had to print it out because it's just a, a exquisitely compact summary of the whole sweep 
from the basal algae roots of plants all the way down to the diversification and, and pollinization issues of angiosperms. And it, it's a yummy one. And the sources in there that you can uh, link to are just absolutely delightful. So um, it, um, there, there's all of that stuff that would need to be accounted for in that flood model, both for working out what the supposed ecological relationships were pre-flood and then the distribution of things and then what happened because everything that was that depended on the ark had to be spreading out from the ark where did cacao come from where where did the bat pollinators for sonora desert cacti uh come from how, how exactly did they carry the cacti with them from the ark <laughs> what, what was did going the pollinators here? eat there were no flowers yeah. to pollinate yeah, yeah, and and the um, th there is in the, it's it, well, I think they got them from the same place that uh, Cain and Abel got their wives from. Uh, you know, that there was somebody pulled a creation over in the next county, as uh, uh, um, William or uh, 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 Clarence Darrow said in the old Scopes trial. Yes, <laughs> somebody pulled a creation over in the next county. <laughs> That there's just way too much that they don't really account for on, on this uh, field. Let's see what else is going on. Um, uh, oh, uh, Immutable says, what about cold-blooded animals like salamanders in the desert that die if it's not hot enough? Yeah, there's a whole ecosystem of things that you have to deal with. Some can estimate uh, that they can actually handle a wide variety of stuff. The whole issue about thermal Please regulation. Please define estimate. Oh, es estimate. They, they basically, they, they just shut down. Uh, um, hibernation is kind of a counterpart of that. Uh, that uh, there are all sorts of critters that well, probably the grand master of this is that weird little tardigrade, the water bears, the little microscopic things you can those freeze them. So yeah, they're so cute. Little those thing. Those cute and, 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 although, if one were the size of a dog, you'd probably <laughs> run in terror from it because it's this weird little critter <laughs> uh, with this little nozzle mouth and all that. But they're they're unbelievably hardy, and um, they can just shut down their little metabolism and wait. There are frogs that can literally, their body, they've got kind of like antifreeze stuff and they can prevent them from, from over crystallizing, but they can be functionally semi-dead. And then when warm things come, then they just whoop and yep, they're, they're happy as all get up. So the ability to shut down the metabolism and then turn it back on, like rebooting the computer after a long time without the battery wearing down is one of the various um, uh, traits. And it, organisms that can do that tend to be fairly reliable when it comes to making through um, mass extinctions. Uh, that's one of the things that's brought out is why did frogs and other ones make it through the mass extinction when dinosaurs didn't? And wh why was it that uh, the ornithine birds made it through the mass extinction, but not the enantornithine birds. And so uh, it's it's the fascinating issues that evolutionists will be grappling with and creationists will be going just, well, just, it's, I, you know, the flood. <laughs> and that's about as far as they're ever going to go with it. And uh, so the, the data field, they just get farther and farther and farther. Oh, uh, a Psy Strike got a screen grab RJ's tardigrade impersonation for blackmail purposes, Psy. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm not Psy, very I good looking as a vertebrate. I'm even less attractive. that on the screen during Pug and Plug, Psy. Yeah, I'm even less attractive as a tardigrade, but they do have these little weird nozzle mouths. And Aren't then they're, they're like they're, 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 yeah, they, they, they have the features that we think of as cute with, with little tiny legs and relatively pudgy body. And, and if you don't look close, that they don't really have eyeballs. And, and, and when you think about what they do and where they live, then that you leash start to came up wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, ancient space heaters. Yeah, yes, that's well. Tardigrades kind of resemble short caterpillars, so they do look kind of cute. Yeah, actually. yeah. Well, then, and that that's an interesting issue uh, from the HOX developmental biology thing. Oh, good gravy! I I, I don't want to miss the fact that I'm supposed to be excoriating a, a nephilim. Um, that um, uh, so a good old nephilim put a thing up on January uh, responding to my points about the reptile mammal transition. He didn't communicate that directly to me. It only popped up in some of his commentaries on, I think, one of Standing for Truth's videos. So I only bumped into it accidentally uh, because of a little side alert that came up. But anyway, I put the link up. Uh, you can find it yourself, the jaw to ear magic, where nephilim is going to disappear the reptile mammal transition. 
and he's got a, a few sources, the, the technical papers, I was well aware of all this stuff, but he's prone to some really amazingly bold assertions. For example, the genetic pathway for the ear bones and jaw bones of the creatures involved are not the same, exclamation mark. No, that's not true. <laughs> Shell reptile, you don't stay on the topic. Yeah, I know, I, I, I wander around, but this is the secondary topic. And so Nephilim, if, if you're not familiar with Nephilim, you're a blessed um, person. Side strike calls drink. Uh, yes, drink, drink. Uh, the, um, uh, at no point does Nephilim ever actually document a technical paper that up supports that claim that the jaw and ear bones have a different genetic pathway. And that's because he can't. And the irony is, uh, if anybody can find that in there, please let me know. You can contact me or whatever, because I don't think I can spot any. Instead, he plays rhetorical shell games. And when he gets down to his next reference point, uh, which was a, a Berkeley bit on um, uh, uh, some stuff, he just kept on insisting that uh, uh, it's just guesswork, it's just uh, um, presupposition. Uh, like one of the uh, University of California paper uh, um, uh, website says, originally the quadrate and articular bones formed the jaw joint, but these synapsids, e.g. probenignathus, and anybody who's read my book will be an old pal of probenignathus, evolved a second pair of bones uh, involved in the jaw articulation. And Nephilim says, so they are claiming these evolutionary changes to jawbone numbers and locations has in fact taken place, but acknowledge they do not know of a mechanism for such evolution, the development of new integrated bones in jaws and their changing integration and form over time. How is that scientific? It's scientific because it's A, an observation, B, they have the developmental biology of the whole process that they have been investigating for 150 years. I mean, that they, these things were first spotted in the 1830s. It's not a new phenomenon. And worse, the very source material that he's blundering past is alluding to this stuff. Uh, later on, he, uh, uh, down the page, he then uh, tries to do a trick. So the bones which comprise the jaw uh, or animals, he meant to say of animals, uh, is determined by separate, and he's misspelled separate, pathways by cell specialization. The bones claimed to migrate and change in morphology are developed by the different physical arrangement of specialized cells early in the development of the animal. The process which determines how cells are organized to become physically arranged and fused together is not understood. And he refers to, he, he googled um, a squamosal bone, and it came up with a science direct um, uh, compendium of various things in the, in the science direct network that related to this issue. And the first one on the top happened to be a thing where they were talking about the, the fusion of the skull bones, which one of which involves the edge of the dentary, uh, the squamosal bone down in the skull, the one that the mammal dentary bone articulates with. And all they were saying in this paper, and I downloaded the whole bloody paper, it wasn't open access, but I had a way of finding out where it is, so I, I checked to see on this. All they were talking about back in 2005 was uh, it was not entirely clear the exact genetic and developmental components that were pulling, that were making the linkages that were the sutures that pulled your skull bones and keep them all tidied up. And this happens, you know, not only in, in embryology, but in the post-development because the baby takes a while to develop all of this stuff. But in the paper, they were alluding to the twist one gene a protein, which apparently was involved in this process, and they were just starting to experiment and investigate this. Well, if you look at that link that Nephilim gave and go over to the right and see some of the other papers up that are from like 2015, there are several book chapters up there, and I downloaded those too, one of which was a juicy one because that was by Brian Hall, one of the major uh, workers in the field, and... Um, uh, he had a thing on dedifferentiation of chondral sites and endochondral ossification. Boy, there's a title to get you flushed. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? But it's also in detail because he went in, in the intervening 10 years, they had found a hell of a lot of stuff on here. And they had worked out um, uh, 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 the role of the HOX genes, and it was just gruesomely detailed as to about how much they know on this subject. And there was a whole section on the poster child for evolution. 
Evolution of the middle ear ossicles, malleus, incus, and stapes is one of the most remarkable examples of evolutionary transformation of developmental and adult structures. In birds and reptiles, the lower jars articulate, and so this is a story that, that we're all familiar with. There is no indication in any of those technical papers that Nephilim's claim that there are different biological systems involved here uh, is true. And that's because it's not true. <laughs> that the, 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 it's the same systems that have gone divergent ways in birds and mammals. Uh, and so everybody that is in the reptile mode and archosaurs in general have retained the articular quadrate connection, whereas we've modified it and we can see step by step, stage by stage, the modification of that. He put a whole slew of, uh, of, of, of material up and indicating the bones and how they were shifting over time and the way the cartilage and various elements are going on. It, it is way beyond what Nephilim thinks is going on because he can't get past a little snippet of a quote that he's culled from a first trip into a website. Uh, another one that he linked to, which I put up as well, is to uh, a, a fairly extensive um, analysis of hearing middle ear development. And there's an awful lot of technical papers on here. In fact, I'm, I've, I've still got to go through uh, some of their listing that I printed out to make sure that I have the relevant ones in my uh, uh, source base. But um, um, the upshot is that I know this is going to be a terrible shock to people, but Nephilim is a really incompetent scholar and uh, that he is superficial, dogmatic, uh, he doesn't read for understanding. He just looks at things for authority quotes to make the argument that he wants to be true. But don't take his word for it. Don't take my word for it. Do your own research. And I, arrogant bastard that I am, am confident that if you read the material yourself, you're going to find that one of us is not a good scholar. And I'm pretty confident that it's not me <laughs> that's the bad scholar here. <laughs> Do you expect him to come out with a uh, a, a video in response to this? Oh, I'm, I'm sure he will. And he'll probably just double down and repeat. Uh, it's like C. Brown and, and for that matter, standing for truth. Uh, I mean, the, these are people who are positively uh, relentless in their ability to just repeat the same tropes. They're very Trumpian. And Immutable Destiny would like to know what the ancestors are of the tardigrade. Oh, uh, that would be wonderful to know. And unfortunately, because they go, we, we know they're, they existed by the Cambrian. They, there's actually a tardigrade fossil. I think it's in the Cambrian. Uh, and they're little itty bitty critters, so they don't stand a very good chance of being fossilized. They're extremely rare. In, and I think other than like that one fossil, there's like no tardigrade fossils. Uh, I mean, they're, they're very, very sparse. And so, oh, so they uh, were on the ark. Yeah, they were on the ark. They were crawling around in there, you know. Yeah, just see all these little mite. Well, who knows? See, they didn't have much space problem with microscopic creatures. You know, they could be all over the place. I wonder if they. I wonder if the mites that live in our eyelashes were in Adam and Eve's eyelashes, or only got there at the time of Noah and were in there, or did they keep him in a little in a little box? Uh, and then after the ark, they say, "Go, my children, find eyelashes." <laughs> It's um, it's very thoughtful of you to specify eyelashes. Oh, there are in fact a little tiny critters. I don't think they live in everybody's eyelashes, but they're widespread in the human population, and they're tiny, tiny, tiny little things. But they, and when you see pictures of them, uh, running around at the eyelash root, you're going, "Yipes! I'm they're inside us." That, I'm just assuming that the eyelash line is not the only place on the body where they may be found. They may very well, but some of them get awfully special. First of all, it's a nice uh, sheltered environment. You're free from predators. I mean, there's nothing that's going to crawl in there particularly to go after you. And it's a nice, it's like a forest and they can munch, 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 and they have their little happy life and they make their little happy little babies and they can live in a comfortable little Eden-esque environment there. And and they're happy, you know. What what can what Some can of one the argue? audience knows where? Okay, never mind. It, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, Shell Reptiles. said Jackson did a, a a video on their on their rep, uh, evolution. That there's uh, it's like there's it's like everything has been studied from an evolutionary point of view. They don't always have and can't always have simple answers to where things came from. 
And uh, if you download my old book, um, uh, Three Back Revolutionary Episodes, there's a, a table that I generated for that, which listed off the fossil record for the animal phyla to scale and you know when and how far back you could trace them. And about half the animal phyla have no fossil record at all. And when you f look at why, they're tiny animals that have no fossilizable hard parts. Well, duh, <laughs> they have no fossil record. <laughs> And so any form that lacks that, and there's an awful lot of, of, of very interesting little critters uh, uh, that fall into that category. Um, how, when did they appear? Uh, since they don't have a fossil record, what? Did they only appear like in, in 1958? Uh, there was one phylum that actually only was discovered in the 1950s. Uh, was it magically created the day before? Or did it exist earlier? That's where the chemistry, the, the DNA analysis comes in. Now they can look at the nuts and bolts of the living organism and working out through things that they have been able to work out plausible family trees that would suggest that these animal phyla actually dated a long way back, even though we don't have a fossil record for them. Same thing that if you just think about it, that the things that make you look the way you do are built off of genes. But the things that shift to make the genes do the thing they do to make you look the way you are didn't appear just before you were born. You're carrying on a baggage of evolutionary ancestry. And so the genetic, if you date when that particular version of the gene originated, that it's going to probably long predate the morphological variation that occurs because it's re-regulated somewhere down the road. So it's no coincidence that molecular dates for fossil record animals tend to suggest an older date than the fossil record are because they're dependent totally on what happened to get preserved. And the odds are the very first one getting preserved always? Nah. Don't, jump Side in, Karis. Has a, um, a question. He asks if the relationship between humans and eyelash mites is symbiotic. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that, but my remembrance of the the stuff is it's not symbiotic in a sense that we benefit from it it's not as though the mites are going around and cleaning away stuff no they just happen to found a habitat that was handy and so, so they they're won't my contacts clean yeah so uh, and if somebody finds some technical literature on that 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 suggests otherwise and i'll be happy to learn it i'll be delighted to i'll add it into my data field but i suspect that they would be classified as parasitical rather than symbiotic. Symbiotic refers to something where both sides are benefiting. And uh, in fact, that's one of the big issues to this day about fungi and lichen. Lichen is a fungus that has a bacterial symbiont. And there's still some dispute as to whether the bacteria is getting anything out of the deal. And if not, then it's like a slave and the lichen is in charge. And so the, the lichen is parasitic, parasitically no, no using the bacteria. RJ, mm -hmm. no kink shame. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, S and M amongst the uh, the, the lichens, uh, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Well, and you do have uh, um, uh, in the plant so world, uh, one of the creepy things that one encounters there are these parasitical plants that take over and, and throttle and kill uh, its structural host. And eventually it's just using the, the former tree as a, as a scaffolding that it lives in. Hmm? Like kudzu vine? I don't know if I'm. Uh, well, kudzus right. are just a, a, an unkillable spawn from hell. They don't <laughs> actually, they don't actually absorb or 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 make use of pre or prior an, uh, uh, plants. They just take over and grow everywhere. They'll smother out in the fact that they'll just grow over whatever is there. Mm -hmm. uh, they're an extremely. Uh, uh, they were put in as as desirable ground cover a long time ago, and boy, did that work because they are just relentless ground cover and there's a masses, masses of places. You, it, you can pack is them back, but they're, but they're very durable and they grow back. And so they're, they're virtually impossible to get rid of. Just as I don't think you could ever get rid of ants or if you even wanted to, uh, that there are, are a variety of insect forms and some kind of things that are just so relentlessly uh, uh, prolific and durable that no, you just you have to maneuver around them and get used to them because they're 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 there. <laughs> they're not going to go away. 
I was inquiring about Spanish moss, if that would qualify. Uh, I'm not familiar with Spanish moss. Unlike some people on, on the line who pretend that they know everything, uh, there are many things I don't know. And in that case, I have no clue. Uh, now, you might find if Jackson were here because he just done the plant thing, I think he probably would have jogged a memory uh, on that and would have been able to give you technical names and all of that. Too. Jackson's everything. on Twitter right now. I'm not sure why he's not in here, Jackson. Oh, oh, well, it's because he wanted to give you the shine of the day, I guess. <laughs> But no, he does. He it, it may have been a thing where um, um, he was just in for, old, or or he does he does do Twitter off of his uh, smartphone, I think. So he could be doing yeah. something else, and all of that. That um, although I, I have cautioned people that Twitter is an awkward thing to do on a smartphone. I found it just impossible because you can't easily find a particular tweet, and since my, my tweeting is extremely tactical. Uh, I want to be able to deal with uh, the particular thing, and I don't want to have to go slugging around eight miles of tweets to find it. Anyway, uh, Brian Stevens says, are they technically symbiotic in that they are commensal? Ooh, commensalism, commensalist, yeah. Type of symbiotic, uh, neither harms nor benefits. Is Spanish moss very beneficial to water oak? It could very well be. Um, the uh, and, and it's not necessarily the case that it needed always to be one or the other that you could theoretically have a symbiotic relationship that starts out in one mode and ends up in another, uh, of one where something is just kind of uh, uh, handy in one context. Um, and, and some of the uh, like cleaner fish and some of these other things that are symbiotic relationships at a much higher level, they're not they're not symbiotic in the in sense of one thing. Or and sharks, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that it just comes to the point where um, the ones that are successfully habituating to one another um make do better and so overall over time boop, that's the model that fits in on that so um, has a remark that he, yeah. uh, they said rj if you haven't seen it i would recommend looking up behind crude lies a parody song of nephi mm -mm. oh dear i will have to write that down yes the uh, he's um uh it would be nice to think that um he is atypical of that he may be kind of an extreme case in the way he does stuff, but he's by no means atypical. Methodologically, uh, there's not a dime's worth of difference between how Nephi is approaching a data field, which is to tactically find as quickly as he can bliptoids that look at least at first glance like they're helping his argument, when in fact they don't. Um, in case I didn't finish the thing about the, the twist gene, that um, there's a technical paper that I uh, brought up uh, from 2016, I think, that goes into the evolutionary history of the twist protein family. It goes way back in the vertebrates. And so I, and I didn't know about that. I didn't have anything on it in my tip reference base until I was researching the side material where like there was a 2015 book chapter on skull sutures and how they form and how they've learned more and more about the twist uh, one gene and its role in there, and there's still uncertain questions. So that means it's ongoing research. So Nephi, the scientists do the work and you creationists don't. And even when they do the work, you don't pay attention to the data, which you need to account for and explain since all of these critters supposedly existed only 6,000 years ago, um, get Nathaniel Jensen and Sanford and, uh, uh, the gang together and have them do a paleogenomic study to work out what the genetic structures uh, were for the created kinds because it's not very long ago good gravy you know these things were only around the the ancestors of all of the birds that we know were aboard the ark only 4500 years ago that's a snap of course they're going to have to figure out how in hell you generate the speciation rate that's going on that's totally out of sync with any speciation rate that has ever been observed in nature over all this time, or is consistent with how genetic flow. I mean, Sanford can prattle on about his, and SFT can prattle on, uh, standing for truth, can prattle on about his um, uh, 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 the genetic entropy arguments, but um, oddly reluctant to apply it to much. And they just cherry pick a little information. Well, Nephi falls into that same category. And uh, um, the advantage of when they are putting things down in text is that now you can say, okay, here's your link. This you thought was a good thing to link to. Let's read it. Let's find out what it is. Let's find out the context. Uh, don't be mis thrown off by jargon. 
if there's terms you don't understand, Google them and find out. There may be things that when I'm starting to think about, what the hell does he think he's doing bringing up sutures? Well, that's okay. Those are the skull plates and they're eventually merging together to form a single solid thing. And in Nephi's case, apparently an unbelievably impenetrable solid skull. But <laughs> nevertheless, the, the genetics are there and they're, they're doing the work. Whereas, where is the creationist counterpart of this? Where is the creationist using their fabulous creation model of, of created heterozygosity? Where are they accounting for why particular genes like Sonic Hedgehog and BMP are being deployed and Twist is doing this and that and why we see the structures that we do. Uh, he makes such a big deal about the fact that they're looking at possums and other uh, non-humans, uh, but the point is, is that they're also looking at human beings. And if you follow up on those technical papers, as I'm doing, in that um, second link that he gave, that there's a long stretch of technical literature and you try to find any justification for Nephilim's main charge in there. They don't have I, to account for it. God did it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, who are we to question God's uh, creation? Yes, yes, indeed. We're never, we're never supposed to do that. So it, it's, a, it's a science stopper uh, that when you look at various people who have technical expertise, it's that when they really start revving up their creationism, uh, it's not merely that their reputation suffers in the secular world. They just stop doing stuff. They just, they, they write apologetic books. I was thunderstruck when I actually saw Nathaniel Jensen's book, how thin and poorly documented it was. How I need smart. to go for the moment, RJ. Oh, yes, yes. And I in fact, we're past six o'clock anyway. And uh, so I really should be cutting down the, the program. Are there any further questions from the audience? I, I've definitely written down behind crude lies, and uh, I will uh, want to follow up on that. Uh, later on in the month, I will not be doing Evolution Hour because I will be on the road, so that we got a couple more shows left. But anyway, uh, thank you all. Uh, anybody that can help out at the Patreon or GoFundMe, please do so. Tell people about the project. The otherwise, let them know about it. Spread the word on Evolution Slam Dunk. The damn thing can't do any good if you don't know about those damn therapsids, and you'll never find a source that pulls it all together as well as I did. I've worked my butt off on that. So uh, anyway, uh, see you all uh, next week, and uh, keep fighting the good fight. And thank you, thank Karis, you for, for gracing our show today. Well, thank you for having me on, RJ. It was an honor, as always. You are always welcome, and you are um, um, the, the delightful voice of the person who can say, explain that, and we should be able to explain it. Otherwise, we don't know it. <laughs> okay, see you next week.